Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. Hello, I'm Artemis Irvin, and in today's episode, we're travelling back to 1939 to uncover the secret story of a group of gay MPs who were among the first to warn Britain about Hitler. The run-up to the outbreak of the Second World War is a familiar story to many of us, from Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler to Winston Churchill's powerful opposition to the policy. Yet even in the most familiar of histories, new and hidden voices can be found, This is exactly what Chris Bryant proves in his powerful new book, The Glamour Boys, a story of a group of gay MPs who opposed appeasement of Hitler. Chris Bryant has been the Member of Parliament for Rhonda since 2001. In 2016, he gave a speech in the House of Commons calling for the group of gay MPs we'll be talking about today to be granted pardons for now overturned sexual offence charges. Chris has written several books, including a two-volume history of Parliament and a critical history of the British aristocracy. He was the first gay MP to celebrate his civil partnership in the Palace of Westminster. I spoke to Chris about the Glamour Boys just the other week. So thank you so much for joining us on Travels Through Time today, Chris. I thought that we could start by telling us a bit about how you first heard of this story and the men involved and what inspired you to write this book. Well, a few years ago, I was writing a history of Parliament kind of from the beginning of time right up until the fall of Mrs Thatcher. And I came across these rather intriguing figures. Uh, One of them was a guy called Jack McNamara, who was the MP for Chelmsford. Nobody had ever heard of him. But I simply read a line which said that he had visited Germany in the 1930s with his researcher, Guy Burgess, who was subsequently revealed to be the Soviet traitor, an archdeacon in the Church of England with whom he was having an affair, and another young official at the War Office, because they were interested in the Hitler Youth. Now, that as a sentence is just so (laughs) intriguing. I wanted to unwrap it and find out all about it. And then I came across Ronnie Cartland, who was Barbara Cartland's younger brother, and was a hero at Dunkirk. And you kind of think, gosh, there's an interesting story here. And they're gay. And well, they wouldn't have used the word gay at all, and it's it's quite difficult to know precisely what word to use for them. I I, I, ref, I refer to some of these as uh, men as queer or nearly queer, so because they're somewhere on the spectrum between homosexual and bisexual, and and then I discovered that they were called the Glamour Boys because they sat with Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden, they plotted with them to overthrow the policy of appeasing Hitler because they had seen the dangers of Hitler's Germany, um, its territorial ambitions, and the way it was treating um, homosexual men and Jewish men and women who they they actually knew, they personally knew in Germany. Mm. And when I unpacked this a bit more, I discovered this, there's just like, it's like a large rugby team <laughs> of um, queer or nearly queer men who were absolutely instrumental in dragging British policy away from appeasing Hitler towards rearming and fighting Hitler. And... They met together. They were and Chamberlain, who hated them, called them the Glamour Boys as a way of insinuating something about their sexuality or something effeminate or untoward about them. Mm. Ran a dark ops campaign against them, had their phones tapped and all the rest of it. And they kept on making bold speeches. And then um, four of them were killed in action in the war, including Ronnie Cartland and Jack McNamara, um, Victor Caslett and Rob Bernays. It's obviously a really famous well-known part of history um, and especially in this country and Churchill is such a famous figure and it's kind of amazing to think that even though we all think that we know this period really well there's still so much to uncover that's been buried it goes to show how well a how deep history is and how much there is still to learn even when we think we've known everything but also how hard people must have worked to ignore this particular story for such a long time. Well I think I, I always thought that I'd have to write this as a as a fiction, because I just thought there wouldn't be any documentary evidence or any evidence of any kind out there, really, about these people's private lives, because it was criminal. It, you know, we had the toughest laws in all of our history at this time, 
um, forbidding homosexual acts of any kind whatsoever. Um, and you could be convicted on the slightest bit of evidence. Nancy Astor's son uh, went to prison and Rob Bernays kind of learnt his fear of all of this because he accompanied Lord Beecham to Australia in 1930, who was given a hard time in Australia because he kept on taking his valet everywhere and they were clearly a couple. Mm. And Lord Beecham ended up being hounded out of British society by his brother-in-law, the Duke of Westminster. So I think a lot of these men would have been desperately aware of the dangers of showing any sign of homosexuality or affection for another man. I mean, you could even be sent to prison for a letter to somebody saying love at the bottom of it, because mm -hmm. that was inciting somebody towards committing an act of gross indecency. And I I'm pretty certain that uh, Barbara Cartland destroyed all of the kind of key material which would have been useful in relation to her brother, Ronnie Cartland, even though, in fact, in the 1920s and 1930s, she was a rather flighty, bold, adventurous spirit, not the kind of meringue, the pink meringue that we later knew her to be. Mm. And uh, there's just one interesting the little snippet that shows quite how far historians have gone. I mean, Victor Cazalet was a close personal friend because he played at Wimbledon. He was a close personal friend with Gottfried von Kram, who was a German tennis star. Um, Gottfried was married, but he actually was homosexual and had a long-standing affair with a, a Jewish man called Manasseh Herbst. And there are letters in the Eton College uh, Library collection of Victor Cazalet's papers, which were used by a historian in the 1970s, but never referred to Victor being quite so close a friend with Gottfried. When Gottfried was arrested in 1937 and sent to prison for having a male Jewish lover mm -hmm. by Hitler, it's pretty clear that Victor Cazalet helped get Manasseh out of uh, Germany into, first of all, Portugal and then Palestine. A and none of that is referred to. Mm. Uh, Gottfried Run Cram came second in the Wimbledon finals, including once to Fred Perry. Mm. I mean, there's a common perception that if you were an aristocrat at this time, it was kind of allegedly easy to be gay. And that we can think of figures from this time, like Cecil Beaton, who you mentioned in the book, they seem to live their lives and socialise and are obviously or seemingly obviously gay and they kind of get off scot-free but then for other people that's not the case but your book like you say is full of examples of how that just wasn't that it's not nearly as simple as that well you, you know you could know and yet not know you could pretend to yourself that you didn't know that somebody else was um, living with another man you, you you sort of made allowances high society made allowances for artistic types or musical types there was there were lots of, lots of kind of coy words, euphemisms for homosexual, which meant that you didn't have to actually acknowledge that somebody was breaking the law. But there was always the danger that you would end up in prison for two years with hard labour. And, and I tell quite a few stories of, of people for whom that, that did actually happen, including one MP who, Sir Paul Latham, who went to prison during the Second World War for having relations with uh, several other men in the army. And, and interestingly, when he got engaged, which is a big society wedding, one of the kind of society magazines said that they were a bit surprised by the engagement because he didn't seem the marrying kind. Mm. So there was a lot of kind of nod, nudge, nudge, wink, wink going on throughout the period. And uh, if you were rich enough, you could probably get away with it. Lots of people, of course, covered their tracks by getting married. But it was not an uncommon thing to slink off from the you know, polite dinner party uh, to one of the raunchier, naughtier bars um, to find more, well, let's call it entertainment mm. elsewhere. <laughs> I mean, the book is a really lovely blend of this kind of cultural social history and what it was like, what it might have been like to be gay at this time. And, and the then... Turkish baths, of course. Yeah. Which ironically were the most, were the, were the safest place because the police had no authority inside the at the baths because they were regulated by the um, by the council <laughs> and and one of them was called the Savoy in German Street and it was open 24 hours and you could rent what was called a bachelor suite for the night and it became a bit of a rite of passage I think for everybody through from Peter Pears to um, a whole host of politicians uh, including possibly Harold Macmillan or at least certainly some people have alleged that um, to, to go there for a, a cruise and a rub. Mm. And of course, you could you could say, I've just been to the Savoy and people might think you'd been, well, to the Savoy Chapel or mm. the Savoy Grill or the Savoy Hotel. 
It seems to be that the line, exactly where the line is, is never clear. So there's room for interpretation there. But then there's also, it's kind of more dangerous because you never know when somebody might turn around and say, okay, well, actually... I, I'm a police I, officer. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, I, and I, I, one of the things I've tried in the book is never to overstate what I can actually know and prove. Mm. Um, but it, of course, I've had to read a lot between the lines. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, one of Ronnie Cartland's best mates, Viscount Carlo, I, I spoke to his son, the Earl of Port Arlington, who's now uh, getting on a bit. And I said to him, um, do you mind if I ask a uh, an indelicate question and he said you're going to ask me whether he's gay whether my father was gay aren't you I said well yes and he said I haven't the faintest idea um, <laughs> I was only six when he died but I could tell you this his best man his number one friend he certainly was Ronnie Cartland he certainly was I think that's one of the things about studying like because uh, I did at university I did a lot of women's history and history of sexuality and that kind of stuff and when it's more of these hidden stories or where the people at the time didn't have the opportunity to express themselves perhaps in the way you do have to read between the lines so much as a historian that can be really that can be really challenging and you have to be like you say so careful not to overstate but you also can't help but you can't ignore what seems really obvious you know if somebody does sign a letter saying love or does refer to somebody in a particular way so there definitely is room for those kind of reading between the lines when it comes to I, I, I was really struck when Anthony Eden was sort of forced to resign in 1938 uh, by Neville Chamberlain resigned as foreign secretary it was just intriguing the list of people that he meets with mm. in the next 48 hours and has dinner with and considers what he's going to do next all of them unmarried three quarters of them I think I can state with certainty were gay yeah. and 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 interestingly of course Eden always used to refer to he always used to call he used to call men dear before we go back in time to the year that you have chosen, I thought maybe you could give us a bit of background about what's been happening in the 30s uh, and in the 20s even and the kind of background to the Glamour Boys activities. The, the men that I've written about in this book used to love going to Germany at the beginning of the 1930s and the end of the 1920s because um, although theoretically it was illegal to be uh, homosexual in Germany under paragraph 175 of the German legal code. In Prussia, which was a large chunk of Germany, the Prussian government, which was led by the Social Democrats, had decided it wasn't going to implement that law. So there was a massive flowering of pubs and bars and restaurants um, exclusively for a queer clientele. In essence, you could go to Germany and have sex, which you couldn't do in the UK legally. And so a whole host of them went and they got to know some of the early gay Nazis. There were quite a few. The leading stormtroopers like Ernst Röhm and um, Edmund Hines were gay and pretty much openly so, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the Nazi party hated homosexuality. They thought it was a stain on the on Aryan virtue and the future of um, Germany. But in 1934, all the gay Nazis were killed by Hitler in the Night of the Long Knives. And the people that I'm writing about who had already worried about the rise of Nazism, like Rob Bernays and, uh, and Bob Boothby, they realised that it was their own personal friends, people they had met, who were now in danger in Germany, either as homosexual men or as Jews. So Harold Nicholson had friends who'd been involved in um, the Night of the Long Knives. Rob Bernays had met Edmund Hines and, and interviewed him. And so these men became in the UK the most vociferous opponents of Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Neville Chamberlain became Prime Minister in 1937. He had a personal belief that he would be able to transform Europe and pacify it, appease it, bring peace to it by doing deals with Hitler and Mussolini. And the group that I'm talking about passionately disagreed with him. And so he, Chamberlain, um, started calling them initially the insurgents or the rebels, and then eventually the glamour boys as a way of insinuating something about them. And he ran a kind of dark ops operation against them run by a man called Sir Joseph Ball. So that leads us very nicely to your first scene. So if you could travel back in time, what year would you like to travel back in time to? And what would be the first scene that you would visit in that year? So I'd go back to 1939. I know that's, you know, for every child in the world knows 1939 as a big year in the history of the world because of the start of the Second World War. But I would go back to the 19th of July, 1939. 
and specifically to Ronnie Tree's house in Queen Anne's Gate in Westminster. It's a beautiful, vast mansion um, overlooking St. James's Park. And gathered there that early evening is a bunch of mostly Conservative MPs uh, sitting on the government side. And, and you've got to bear in mind that Neville Chamberlain had a, has a vast majority in the House of Commons, easily outnumbering all the other parties put together by several hundred. And the rebels are, you know, the most famous people we know about are Anthony Eden and Winston Churchill. They're both there. But Ronnie Tree um, is a relatively new MP, actually um, wealthy because of his uh, American family. Um, he's married, but he has several affairs with men and with women. He'd visited Germany in, the, um, in, the, in 1934 with um, Rob Bernays and knew then that war was coming with Germany. He, he knew as early as back then. So he's gathered in his room. All the glamour boys are there. Jack McNamara is there, the MP for Chelmsford. Um, Ronnie Cartland's there, the young MP for one of the Birmingham constituencies who's, who's been a rebel from almost the moment he arrived in Parliament. And their big concern at this particular moment is the Prime Minister is talking about suspending Parliament for a summer recess. And they're worried that Chamberlain will do exactly the same as he did the year before, which is have a long summer recess and do a deal with Hitler, use the time to surrender. That was when he surrendered, effectively surrendered Czechoslovakia to Hitler um, in the Munich Agreement. And he, he famously came back to the UK with his piece of paper proclaiming that it was... Uh, that he had secured peace and everybody cheered and everybody was relieved, apart from the Glamour Boys and the Tory rebels. So they're meeting and they're trying to decide what to do because they're nervous that if they fight too hard, they'll be thrown out of the Conservative Party. They've all been threatened with deselection. Ronnie Tree knows that his phone is being tapped and probably all the others know the same as well about their own phones. They're nervous too because the whips, the government whips, have been watching the House so there's a sense of sort of fearfulness about what should they do. There's, there are threats of having a general election, extraordinarily. And that might mean that they might all be out of a job and thrown out of the Conservative Party. So I'd just love to sit in that room and to see the different people at play. Jim Thomas, Anthony Eden's former private secretary who'd resigned with him a year earlier. Normally the, the most kind of affable and jolly of the, of the, of the group. Uh, Vivian Adams a bit more assertive, Bob Boothby quite grumpy and telling everybody they've got to be more active, Harold Nicholson, sometimes he's the kind of glue that brings them all together. So I, I'd just love to be in that room to see how, you know, who was leading the argument. And what would you say was the kind of atmosphere of, I mean, it's hard to say the whole country, but do you feel like they had the, they had the impression that people were basically on their side and most people felt threatened by Hitler or did they feel like they were this tiny group against the rest of the country um, and nobody was listening to them? So it's a really important point that Neville Chamberlain certainly thought that the country was on his side and didn't want to go to war at any cost. That He thought that Britain wanted to appease Hitler and I suspect most politicians did and so this group of men was definitely swimming against the tide of public opinion, or they thought they were anyway. I mean, there wasn't a very reliable way of knowing what public opinion was at the time, other than by-elections, maybe. But there weren't, you know, opinion polls on, on these issues. Mm. Um, and some of the, you know, political activity, rallies and things that people went to w could tell in both directions at the same time. So, but they certainly thought that they were swimming against the tide. So they had to use that element of courage. And part of my argument is that I think one of the reasons that they were able to do that was because a lot of them in their private lives swam against the tide already. Mm -hmm. And they knew what it was to be on the on the side of society rather than in, in, the, in the mainstream. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, that some of them knew their phones were being tapped and they were being followed and watched and that kind of thing. I mean, how vulnerable do you think they were to having their sexuality being used against them in a way to undermine their political argument? Oh, it it was very common for them to have phone calls from newspapers saying, why are you still a bachelor? Mm. And uh, that word bachelor or unmarried was almost like an allegation. Mm. <laughs> and so, of course, they were very nervous about that. And, and they knew that the government whips office 
would have a list of people's minor failings and peccadilloes. And they knew that Chamberlain was not passed using that if he wanted to. And and Sir Joseph Ball, who uh, was running this kind of secret operation on behalf of Neville Chamberlain, partly based in Downing Street and partly outside, had actually bought a newspaper in which to print all this horrible, Mm -hmm. anti-Semitic, homophobic nonsense. Now, they probably didn't know that Joseph Ball had done that, but they certainly knew who Joseph Ball was. And probably it's difficult to be certain about this, but there's certainly quite a few allegations that Joseph Ball himself, though married, twice married, was also homosexual. And even the head of the Conservative Party, J.C.C. Davidson, said um, that he, you know, he was somebody who was more acquainted than most with the crooked side of life. Nancy Astor's son had been in prison by this stage, and they all knew Bobby Gouldshaw, very, very handsome man by all accounts. And Nancy Astor managed to keep it all entirely out of the papers because she had a husband who owned one half of the newspaper industry and her daughter's lover owned another half of the newspaper industry. So it was relatively easy. But but that was not available to those who um, you know, opposed Neville Chamberlain all, in all of this. I, th- I think they were phenomenally brave. And I take a lesson for the modern era because both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in the last few years have seen you know, attempts at purging people that don't fit with the leadership at any particular time. And I just think that that is a, it's a profound mistake, that one of the great joys of our parliamentary system is that rebels can hold a government to account. We should value that rebelliousness. Absolutely. I think I just wanted to ask as well, just to touch upon, because I feel like the World War II history fans who are listening would be a bit annoyed with me if I didn't quickly ask about what Churchill's role was in the Glamour Boys. Was he, was, would he have been characterised as a Glamour Boy by Chamberlain? Uh, yes, uh, Churchill was definitely a glamour boy. And, and incidentally, one of the reasons that we always identify Churchill as the hero of the hour is because Churchill got to write many of the history books himself. And I, I, I don't want to denigrate him in this, not least because Churchill was deeply touched by each of the deaths of the four men in the book. I mean, he was quite close to them. He, he regularly dined with them. And Jack McNamara is probably the, the most out of the lot. You know, he had Guy Burgess for a researcher, and you don't do that unless you're fairly bold and brave, because Guy Burgess never did much to hide his sexuality. Mm. Um, but Winston wrote, when, when Jack McNamara died in 19, 1944, uh, Winston wrote to Jack's mother, Natalie Orpen, he wrote... He was all that a man should be. Mm. And Churchill must have known that Jack was queer. So if anything, I'm giving an extra star to Churchill rather than take one, <laughs> taking one off him. No, of course. So they meet at Ronnie True's house and they, they plan what they're going to do to prevent um, Chamberlain from appeasing Hitler anymore. Any, any well, further. and the key thing is, on this occasion, they want to prevent Chamberlain from suspending Parliament for two months during the summer because they just don't trust him. They think that what he'll do is he'll surrender Poland just like he surrendered uh, Czechoslovakia the year mm-hmm. before. Which leads us really nicely on to the second scene that you'd like to visit in 1939, which is at the House of Commons. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about that? My second scene is the evening of the 2nd of August, uh, 1939. This is meant to be like a very simple debate about whether Parliament should have a summer holiday. But Chamberlain wants Parliament to go on holiday until the, till the 3rd of October. But the Glamour Boys are terrified that um, Chamberlain, as I said, is, is going to do yet another deal with Hitler during this period when Parliament isn't sitting and they don't want to let that happen. They're conscious that Hitler is now threatening Poland, the Danzig Corridor and, and all of that. Um, and they just think the parliament should be sitting. So in theory, it's an innocuous debate, but it's a, it's a, which is just about whether to go on holiday. But the glamour boys are determined that Chamberlain shouldn't get away with it. So the debate starts and the normal convention is that a debate such as this is not, it's not a matter of confidence. It couldn't bring a government down if the government lost. But then Chamberlain speaks for a second time in the debate and suddenly changes all the rules and said, this is effectively a matter of confidence. And anybody who is voting against the motion is voting against him remaining as prime minister, effectively. And that absolutely infuriates them. Chamberlain had had intended the debate just to stop at that point, but it carries on. 
And in the meantime, whilst um, a Liberal MP is speaking, the Glamour Boys all come out of the chamber of the House of Commons. It's the, it's the old chamber. It's not quite the one we have today. It's the Victorian chamber. They come out into the lobbies and, uh, and they do, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to abstain? Are we going to vote against? Um, and, you know, how can we take the fight back to Chamberlain because he's completely changed the terms of the debate and all the rest of it? And Vivian Adams, who's uh, another of the Glamour Boys, he goes to Harold Nicholson and says, well, you must speak. And Harold Nicholson says... Honestly, I, I promised I wouldn't. I can't. And then somebody says, oh, well, we must find Ronnie Cartland. Somebody says, oh, Ronnie's gone to the loo. So they go to find him. Vivian Adams goes to find him in the gents. And he's there with Churchill. And, and Ronnie has said to him, well, there's nothing more we can do now. And Churchill says, no, there is a lot more we can do. This is just the time to fight, to speak, to attack. So Ronnie then goes back into the chamber and is called fairly soon afterwards. But he's not prepared anything. He admits that he, he speaks far too loud. It's like he's got a megaphone because he's so nervous. And he starts saying that, that, that somebody has written to him to say that Chamberlain has ideas of dictatorship. And everybody gets, I mean, you know, the chamber starts to get very angry with Ronnie um, because obviously the majority of Tory MPs fiercely support um, the prime minister. Um, but he ploughs on and he says, no, uh, he, you know, he's worried about this, uh, the, uh, these ideas of dictatorship. And then he, he sort of reins himself in because he knows he's talking too loud. and he, he sort of calms down. And then he says, we are in the situation that within a month we may be going to fight and we may be going to die. Now, he's saying this because he's already enlisted in the Royal Artillery. And he knows perfectly well that it, if there is war, he may well be shipped out to France you know, or to Belgium very, very soon. And his next door neighbour MP laughs at him, Patrick Hannan, who is a man who had actually nominated him to be selected as the Conservative MP in the first place in his constituency. Ronnie turns on him um, quite aggressively and says, it's all very well for the Honourable Gentleman to laugh. There are thousands of young men at the moment in training in camps and giving up their holiday. And the least that we can do here, if we are not going to meet together from time to time and keep Parliament in session, is to show that we have immense faith in this democratic institution. So he wants Parliament to sit so it can do its job properly. And afterwards, everybody thinks that Ronnie has completely blown his political career. He knows that the whips are furious. All the newspapers the next day are calling for him to resign. Um, uh, Chamberlain's writing nasty pieces about him in his diaries um, and his letters to his sisters um, and determined to get him out of Parliament as fast as possible. What happens after this speech is made and this debate is had? What's the vote? Uh, so... Chamberlain wins the vote quite easily because um, even the rebels abstain rather than vote against. Um, and so Parliament goes into recess. But of course, you know, events come along and completely overturn that. And a, a few weeks later, Parliament is sitting to hear Chamberlain announce that we are now at war with Germany. And interestingly enough, on the morning that uh, Chamberlain has made his announcement um, on the radio first, the, most of the Glamour Boys are again in... Um, Ronnie Tree's house and they they have to rush having listened to the announcement on the radio they have to rush to parliament um, all of them bundled in one car at the same time and then there's an air raid um, warning mm. so some of the so they end up kind of bundled down into the new air raid shelter in the bottom of the house of commons um, Rob Bernays is at a meeting uh, because he's a junior minister at the time and he is worrying on that morning about um, well, war actually means you've got to have enough stretchers, um, nurses, bandages. So that's what he's worrying about because he's a minister in the Department for Health. Um, and Jack McNamara is in church. By this stage, he's a colonel um, of the London Irish Rifles. So he's in church with his men. And um, when they hear the, that we're at war with Germany and comes back to um, Parliament um, in his uniform. So they're all gathered from different you know, places to, to, to hear the, the final announcement mm -hmm. uh, in September in the House of Commons. So, um, and as, as one of the other junior ministers who was also homosexual, Harry Crookshank, put it, it was all a bit of a waste of time having that debate in August because we were always going to be coming back much earlier than the 3rd of October. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that many of them had been anticipating for years and years and years. As you mentioned <laughs> earlier, um, since 1932, that people had first started to suspect Hitler's real motivations. 
Exactly. We, I mean, I think everybody in Britain knows that the version of history that everybody knows in Britain is that Churchill was the first person to start warning about Hitler. Nobody would listen to him. And then finally they did. And then he became prime minister. Mm. And then we fought Hitler and defeated him. Actually, there's quite a few other people who were in on that just as early as Churchill, in, including... Um, all the people that I'm writing about in this book, but but most notably Bob Boothby um, and Rob Bernays, who were writing about this in 1932. And that was based on their experiences of going to Germany, um, partly because of how, how you described that Germany was a f- somewhat more of a sexually liberated place d- during the 30s. Well, Berlin uh, in particular was the most liberal city in the world in the 20th century. Mm. Um gay men could go and have sex there with impunity. And Bob Boothby, who pretty much denied his homosexuality for all of his life, but I think, uh, and certainly had affairs with men and women, including Harold Macmillan's wife for some considerable period of time. Um, but Bob Boothby says that he went to Germany quite a lot. And and because he was so handsome in the 1920s, he was, he was chased a lot by homosexual men, uh, which he rather enjoyed. Well, I, I, I don't think he was just chased. I think sometimes he was caught as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Artemis. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd, one of the world's leading visual historians. His extraordinary photo colorization work has appeared on the covers of National Geographic, Life and People magazines, and he's worked on special projects for titles like The Times of London and NPR. Through his expertly researched and detailed work, Jordan has brought to life some of the most famous events and people from modern history. Whether it's his portrait of Abraham Lincoln or his sweeping panorama of the D-Day beaches in 1944. One of my current favourites is a photograph taken on the 1911 Terra Nova expedition to the Antarctic. The original shot is strange and beautiful and it shows just how otherworldly parts of our planet can sometimes look but the image is completely elevated by the deep and icy blues that Jordan's colorization work brings out. This, alongside many others, are available to buy as prints, and they make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past. To find your favourite historical image, have a look at Jordan's site at www.colorgraph.co. For your third and final scene that you'd like to visit in 1939, we're in October, so... What's happened by the time we've got round to October? So Britain's now at war and everybody is terrified um, of invasion. That's the main anxiety. There are trenches in all the main parks in central London. There are air raid warnings. There are air raid shelters. The House of Commons has got um, blue bulbs in uh, blue or green bulbs in the places where they can't hang blackout curtains. Uh, it's a blackout across the whole of the country at night. And lots of men, of course, have, have already enlisted in either in um, some form or other of the regular army or they've joined uh, reserve battalions um, and quite a lot have joined anti-aircraft battalions. Um, now, Victor Cazalet, uh, who who had fought in the First World War, incidentally, uh, was decorated in the First World War. He, by this stage, he, he he has a lovely house next door to Harold Nicholson down in Kent called Great Swift, which he's effectively rebuilt. It's very, very beautiful. He's wealthy. He sets up an anti-aircraft battalion in Sevenoaks. Um, and he rec- he only recruits men if he's met them at the Dorchester. He interviews them at dinner at the Dorchester. It's It's a very casual affair, apparently. After one visit from a senior officer, the official report from the battalion said, uh, all it said about this visit was, he was an absolute charmer. (laughs) Um, Quite a lot of the men are queer or nearly queer, including sort of aristocratic society photographer uh, who later became a gossip columnist, Broderick Haldane, um, who described himself as a backward boy. And he applied to the battalion because he understood that it was the, the, the right kind of place for them to join. Uh, and another artist called Roland Pym, who painted a, a, a mural in the, in the HQ featuring Victor and others in Napoleonic costumes, um, astride a mound of Lewis guns. Uh, and it was renowned as a bugger's battery, indeed so renowned as a bugger's battery. Those are not my words. Um, but that um, Lieutenant Colonel Evelyn Powell asked his, his wife to leave the room so that he could explain to the, his son-in-law 
that he didn't think he should join the Buggers Battalion. <laughs> Um, uh, others called it a sissy AA battery or the monstrous regiment of gentlemen. I just love the idea of queer men just finding a way in which they could do their bit for the for the country. Mm. And and it needed to be a fairly safe space. And interestingly enough, um, Jack McNamara, who was by this stage colonel of the London Irish Rifles and had been in the um, regular army himself in India, um, in the 1920s um, and 30s and, and then resigned his commission um, before bec- coming into Parliament when he went back into the Reserve Battalion, the London Irish Rifles. Um, he, renowned as, have a, a, as a recruiter into the, uh, into the battalion, and it seems that quite a lot of the senior officers in his team were, certainly, uh, were at least sympathetic to having a queer commanding officer. Mm. For somebody who doesn't know very much about the army, could you just explain a bit about what an anti-aircraft battalion is and what kind of things would they get up to? Well, so anti-aircraft battalions are there to fire down a German aircraft um, flying over the south coast um, and into London. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and, and you had kind of heavy versions and light versions, and uh, but, but a lot of the south coast and um, Kent and, and so on were... Uh, peopled with these anti-aircraft batteries, to, um, a- another part of the Battle of Britain. And you speak a bit about how they had this reputation as being the Montrose Regiment of Gentlemen, which is sounds like a really good name for a punk band or something. <laughs> um, again, it, it, it makes me think of this question of where exactly is the line of acceptable and not acceptable, where, you know, there's reputation and euphemism and rumour and then there's fact and... Um, doing something which is punishable and criminal. It's really hard to tell exactly wh- when something is acceptable and when something isn't. I mean, obviously, it's great that I'm happy that things were able to go ahead as they were. But do you see what I mean? Yes. I, look, lots of these things we only know now because people wrote books after the decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1967. And in fact, Broderick Haldane, his book only appeared after he died. Mm. Um, because you know he was he was he was too nervous about what people would think, um, but he you know he describes creating a rock garden whilst James Pope Hennessy, um, another uh, gay member of the uh, battalion, took his typewriter onto the gun emplacement to work on a book, um, <laughs> whilst theoretically looking out for the enemy. Yeah. Um, and and Haldane also, I mean, he he says that it was quite jolly because Victor would come along once a week and rally the troops kind of thing and then and then he would say I, I really do have to hurry I'm having tea with Queen Mary <laughs> um so there's an element of camp about all of this of course yeah. which which is a sort of maybe it's inevitable um that in a moment of you know real fear and anxiety and national crisis um people have to find a space in which they can be themselves but but none of this would have been said publicly at the time mm. none of it because people would have been terrified you spoke a bit about the like your sources needing to read between the lines and go over things and and as you just mentioned read things that were written retrospectively about stuff that was happening at the time i mean you include so much source material in this book i wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about what you found and and how you went about finding it because it seems like such a treasure trove so obviously there are some things which have been written by people who lived longer in particular you know, some artists and writers who felt more free to do so. Just sometimes I've just had to pull on a string. So, for instance, in 1926, there's a story of Jack McNamara getting into trouble in Tunis, and there's a story about it in The Times. Um, And it's a bit uncertain what the nature of the trouble is, but he's arrested and he's thrown into a Tunisian prison. And I noticed that the person who sort of tried to help him out was a chap called Arthur Lett Haynes. He was the guy who'd written the letter to The Times. Arthur Lett Haynes was a famous artist, as it turns out, lived with Cedric Morris. Um, all their papers and their diaries are in the Tate Gallery mm. archives. Through Ancestry.co.uk, I managed to find Jack McNamara's lover's family, uh, who were Herbert Sharp, and they provided me with photos and stories from Herbert Sharp's daughter about how Guy Burgess used to come round to their house with um, a, a selection of young men. I, I looked up the Bernays um, brothers, uh, Richard and Robert, on the company's house directory list, and that gave me their address. And, and then they had 
loads of letters and a handwritten diary from 1930, which has never been published before, and his personal accounts of the debates in the House of Commons, again, which have never been used or referred to before. So I I just started picking up bits and pieces here and there. And even Maggie Hambling ended up being useful because she knew Arthur Lett Haynes and Cedric Morris. I also wanted to know what happens to the rest of the Glamour Boys as the war goes on. Maybe you could tell us a bit about where everyone finds themselves and did any of them, well, how many of them made it to the end of the war? Jim Thomas survives, uh, goes on to become a a minister after the war um, and gets a viscountcy. Quite often the government gave viscountcy hereditary titles out to uh, men who were never going to have children. Harry Cruikshank, likewise, carries on after the war and and, and becomes uh, a minister. Uh, Harold Nicholson loses his seat in 1945. Brendan Bracken loses his seat in 1945 to the Labour Party. Bob Boothby goes on to become quite a famous member of the House of Lords who gets into trouble with the Cray brothers. MI5 describe him in not very flattering terms in his sexual activities as well. So it's a, it's a very mixed sort of bag for you know, what happens to the, to the long list after the war. I was also wondering if you had a particular favourite that in your research for this book you'd become attached to or you particularly liked. My favourite is Jack McNamara. I think he was the naughtiest. <laughs> in lots of history books, he is described as having been a member of the Anglo-German Fellowship, which was a, a pro-Nazi organisation in the UK. That is simply untrue. There is no evidence of that whatsoever. So I feel a bit as if I'm rescuing his reputation in that regard. But he, he was clearly a great leader of men. He, he, he was desperate to lead men into action in the war. And he was miserable when endlessly um, Churchill and um, Pug Ismay kept on sending him off to jobs based in the UK, guarding airfields and things like that, because he wanted to be you know, in the thick of it. Uh, eventually, he does get sent out, first of all, to Africa to yet another training job. Um, And then uh, he's part of the um, team based in Barry uh, in Italy, which is running raiding exploits uh, in Greece and in Yugoslavia. And in fact, it's in Italy that he when he went visiting his former troops in the London Irish uh, that he gets killed by German mortar. He comes certainly comes across as hugely charismatic in the book. I think it's your opening scene as him being potentially caught in Tunisia. It's like instantly thrown into the action. I instantly kind of warm to him. <laughs> yeah, and and well, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know whether you've seen the photos of him, but uh, even Montgomery commented on the fact that he was very muscled. <laughs> well, before we head back um, to the. Well, considerably safer present. We're not exactly in a war, but we are in a pandemic, so not that much safer, maybe. Um, what memento would you like to bring back with you from 1939, if you could? Well, the strange thing is I don't have to bring back a memento because every day I go into the House of Commons chamber, the mementos are there on the walls because when Victor Caslett was killed, he was with General Sikorsky. Um, and interestingly enough, his last day was spent with John Perry, who was John Gielgud's lo- lover. When Victor Caslett was killed in Gibraltar when their aircraft crashed, Churchill was so upset that he decided that when the chamber of the House of Commons was rebuilt because it had been bombed, um, we would have shields for each of the MPs who'd been killed in action on the walls. So down behind the Speaker's chair, there's a shield for Jack McNamara. And that's my memento. Mm, That's wonderful. I can't help resist but ask you if you think about the those men and the speeches that they made when you go into work and you also make speeches in the House of Commons. Very often. I have to be careful because I, when I think about how they've been, not deliberately, but sort of inadvertently written out of the history books, it does make me tearful. And so I, you know, I have no idea whether Jack would love this book coming out. <laughs> or be scandalised and want to sue me. But I hope that, you know, well, if he were alive today, I think he would he would be probably happily married with another man. Yeah. Maybe not Guy Burgess. <laughs> that would be quite a dangerous person to be married to, I think. I think so too. Oh, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us on Travels Through Time. Thank you very much for having me. That was me, Artemis Irvin, talking to Chris Bryan about the year 1939.
His new book, The Glamour Boys, The Secret Story of the Rebels Who Fought for Britain to Defeat Hitler, is out on the 12th of November and is published by Bloomsbury. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, goodbye.